let's talk game design. Specifically, let's talk about game design elements that we can bring into the classroom to make our activities more engaging. And to do that, we're going to start with a basic overview of why games. What's the, what's the driving force behind their sudden uh, popularity in education? Then after that, we'll talk about game design for the classroom. And we're not really going to focus specifically on video games, but actually board games, because the mechanics of board games are just as critical and actually as the old adage goes in game design if it's fun on paper it's fun digitally if it's not fun on paper not fun digitally so we'll really kind of go back to the basics and think about core game design elements and then finally ways to overcome designers block now with games we have to ask ourselves well why games why now what's with the the increase in popularity over the last five years and it really comes down to they are the dominant form of entertainment for almost like two and a half generations now. You have the, the off-sited Pew Research Report from 2008 that said 97% of 12 to 18-year-olds play some form of digital game. And really, it, it kind of stems out into this larger issue that they're becoming a cultural a form and a literacy that there's an expectation you have a literacy in. Just as we understand how movies work, books work, and music works, these younger generations so accustomed to games expect everyone has that same literacy that they do in games. And so as it becomes this form of entertainment, it's also different than traditional forms of entertainment and that it's not solely consumptive. With a book, I consume the material. With music, I consume it as a listener. It doesn't change and adapt to my decisions, which is what games do, and that makes them not only the, the latest media literacy, but a fundamentally different one, in that the choices I make have ramifications within the, the media. And that's a really key part in this whole talk, actually. Because what we really do with games is give the players, I almost said students there, but the players a way of doing and being so that they have these experiences and they can learn through taking action and seeing the consequences of their action as Kolb says so how do we get these experiences to be created because that's really the driving mechanism one of the best descriptions I ever heard about games in general is that they are a narrative which we then use to tell our own stories. So we place ourselves in these environments inside of a structure and we tell our own stories, which is a really powerful motivator for, for people, and especially with language learners when we're conceiving these ideas and then having these experiences, we want to communicate these ideas. And, you know, Salen and Zimmerman, who uh, published The Rules of Play, you know, they talk about the role of the game designer as you know conceiving and designing rules and structures that result in an experience for players and i always like to balance this description of a game designer with the role of the instructor which is conceiving and designing rules and structures that result in learning for students and one of the the fascinating parts about game designers and good teachers is that they're often having the same discussions just with slightly different vocabulary just like designers want to create experiences, we want to create learning opportunities. So there's a lot we can learn from games because they are you know, powerful learning mechanisms. One of my favorite examples is if you have played Super Mario Level 1-1, there's no written instruction, there's no verbal instruction, but the pure design of the level teaches you everything you need to know how to play Mario. So it's incredibly well designed. So what can we learn from that design? Because one of the things with games is that they have these goals that players feel motivated to reach. And one of the reasons they feel motivated to reach these goals is because along the way they make meaningful decisions. And that's really important. You know, and the fundamental question we have to ask ourselves as we make classroom activities is what meaningful decisions does the player or student get to make in my activity? And that can really depend on a lot of different factors because things like age, experience, in our case, language, knowledge, can really play a difference in whether a game is, is fun, engaging, and motivating, or whether it's, it's boring. So as a great example, take a look at tic-tac-toe. Now, any two adults, if you have them play tic-tac-toe, are probably going to come to a draw almost all the time because they both understand 
all the necessary moves needed to complete the game and win. And unfortunately, you know, as we do that, we understand that these patterns become rote. We start to memorize them, and the, that's when the game becomes kind of dull or unexciting. Because with tic-tac-toe, the possibility space or the options and choices I get to make are entirely too small. For a kid, you know, typically under the age of 9 or 10, they love tic-tac-toe because their brain hasn't developed enough to understand all the possible moves. But after they get to a certain age, you'll notice they'll start saying it's boring. What they're really saying is they've solved that game. They know how to complete it and achieve a win state. And, you know, that's what we really have to think about with games and activities in the classroom is we need to have them that are at the margins of our, the player's abilities. This is something Rafe Coaster talks about in his excellent book, A Theory of Fun. You know, the reason people continue to play checkers is our brain can't solve that space. We can't think through all the possible moves. Same thing with chess. You know, although I understand all the moves of chess, I don't understand all the possible combinations of moves. I can't think that far ahead. So it continues to fascinate us for our whole lives. So when we think about good games, you know, they're they're motivating because we have decisions and choices. And those choices really are up to the player. So we get this freedom to make these decisions and it rests at the margins of our ability. It's too complicated for our brain to solve. There's too many moving parts and pieces. This is what, you know, are the good characteristics of games and so the question we should ask ourselves is are these characteristics in my classroom activities so how do we do that you know how do we make our classroom activities more game like you know one of my favorite definitions of games was by bernard suits who says a game is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles and I like to counter that with my own definition of activity which is the mandatory attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles you know so what can we do better to make people want to willingly opt in and participate in games and I argue that for teachers we can kind of look at the very basic kind of games that we use in the classroom and with some modifications by adding some game design elements we can get a much more engaging game out of it. So up on the screen we see like a typical classroom board game. You know, perhaps players roll dice or they flip a coin and they're going to move. They're going to go through the spaces, answer the questions until they get to the finish line. Well, the question we would want to ask ourselves, what does the player do? A great way to start thinking about games in the classroom is to ask yourself two fundamental questions. So what does a player do in the sense of how many verbs does the player have? In this case, they roll dice, so you have one verb, and answer questions. That's the second verb. Well, there's more to winning than that, though. Um, how does the player win? Well, they, they're the first to finish. So if it's a coin flipping or a dice rolling mechanic that they use, it really kind of comes down to luck. So if there are two players playing and one consistently rolls more four, fives, and sixes than the other, and of course answers the questions, they're going to be ahead. And there's nothing more frustrating to a player when they realize, they understand that luck is determining their success in the game because it removes them from the action. They become a passive participant almost. So we have to think about a game like this is not really a game because it's a race, really. If I can just statistically roll higher numbers than you, and answer the questions, I'm going to win. You can't really stop that. Well, one of the things that we can do to think about making games more dynamic is just think about three basic elements. And these are the three elements that you can apply to almost any game to really get new and novel um, design out of it. And so those three things are theme, action, and strategy. So let's kind of take a look at a working example. So we'll take this board game idea that we have. So maybe I should add a theme to this. So themes are a great way to make something you know, more visually engaging and more appealing in that sense. And also what's really nice about a theme that's great for game designers is these constraints the theme places upon the game get you thinking outside the box. You have to think about what makes sense within the theme. So if you had some sort of you know, polar 
theme or jungle theme, you know, you wouldn't have a polar bear in the jungle and you wouldn't have monkeys in your polar bear theme either. So there's, it kind of gives these constraints and that's a very general example at the moment, but let's dig into it. So one of the things I thought about is I helped work on a game called Trace Effects. You can see it at AmericanEnglish.state.gov. And this is a game for English language learners around the world. Um, typically younger learners get a chance to practice English in a, in a video game like setting. And I thought Trace might be a great theme for my board game. So if I take Trace Effects, the, the game, and add that theme to my board game, perhaps I'll get something a little more dynamic. And inside of Trace, the basic story of Trace is he accidentally travels back in time from the future and he arrives in the present day and he has to complete the mission of the time machine by helping specific people around the United States. So travel and exploring America is a big part of Trace effects. So I thought to myself, well, what if my board were the United States? So instead of just going across those squares with a question, we travel across the states. Well, also, thinking about my theme, I have four main characters in Trace. So I have Eddie in green, Kit in purple, Trace in blue, and Professor Peterson in white. They have very clear designated color schemes that then I can apply to the game. So I kind of mapped this out, and one of the important things to think about with game design for the classroom is prototype, prototype, prototype. So I grabbed a map, you know, unf uh, you know, rolled it out, and I grabbed some buttons from the local uh, super, you know, supermarket, and I just placed them out. And I thought to myself, okay, so each player has to go, you know, ten places across the United States. We're all trying to get to California. So it's a race across the United States to get to California first. So I've got Trace up at the uh, traveling across the northern part of the states, Kit going through the middle, including my home state of Ohio. There, Professor Peterson goes across, you know, kind of the the low middle of the states, and finally Eddie goes through the south. But they're all going to California. So suddenly I'm starting to get a little more of a theme going in my game. So. What is my theme saying? Well, it race against your friends to discover the United States. And kind of my tagline for the game is gather knowledge as you travel the country. The player who reaches California with the most knowledge wins. So that means that this game is a points accumulation game. But I'm not going to call them points. I'm going to call it knowledge. So the gaining the knowledge. But that's going to be a big part in some of the other design choices I make later on. And that goes back to action. So I've got this loose theme. Now I need some actions. This is really important. So for example, you know, if I go back to my traditional board game and, you know, I've got a question like, you know, what do you study and how are you and how do you get to school right there in the middle? You know, I might roll right past the questions I can't answer. So if I land on how do you get to school and I don't know that one, but I know how are you and what are your hobbies, it can be very frustrating because luck determined that I'm going to get this wrong. Now, of course, there's other elements, what we call metagame elements involved, such as did the student do the homework? Did they study? Do they know the vocabulary? But fundamentally, just letting dice determine what I do is frustrating. Um, you know, again, younger players will really grasp onto it. If you're familiar with the game Candyland, there really is only one choice in Candyland. Do you want to play Candyland? Yes or no. After you make that choice, everything else is luck. That's why you'll notice after a certain age, kids no, long, no longer care for Candyland because it gets dull. Uh, they understand that luck is a driving factor, so they quit playing. So what I want to think about there is a few basic actions in game design. We have two basic actions you can think of, two categories operation actions and resultant actions. Operation actions are things like you know, moving your piece and drawing a card, things that move the game along, things you have to do. Resultant actions are the interesting part of games and this is where the fun really comes in. So these are like goals that you want to achieve such as protect a piece or force the move on an opponent. And a great way I like to think about this is when my students are playing a classroom activity, are they waiting on their turn or are they scheming until their turn? Because if they're just waiting, 
the players really aren't influencing one another. So it's not really a game, it's more of a race. But if they're scheming and thinking, okay, so if Jaime rolls that, and then Farah rolls that, then I can do this, and that'll, you know, and they start to kind of figure things out. Well, you know, let's think about these operational actions. So a racing game that is luck-driven might use like a die. And I really don't want that luck-driven racing style format. I need my players to accumulate knowledge points. Well, could they gather cards? So could I make my game a points gathering game that uses cards instead of rolling the dice? So I'm going to change my operation action from dice to cards. And what this does is suddenly creates another layer of variable inside of the game. So when we look at something like uh, our board game here or even something like uh, checkers or chess, they are perfect games. And that means that all the knowledge that all the players can have is right there on the board for everyone to see. Now, an example like chess, it's still very complex, but the information is all there for everyone to see. Whereas an imperfect game is like poker, where I have cards and I have information that is private to me, and you have information that is private to you. And how this gets negotiated can be the, the strategy component. So by adding the cards, I can go from having a perfect game to an imperfect game. And so that gives us a more of a chance and more of an opportunity to have actions and choices because this information is hidden. And it also does what I like to call create a pleasant tension in the game. Always thinking about what's next, what's going to happen. So I thought about making little cards. So as the players move across the United States map, um, they can draw a card with a language challenge. So for example, they draw a card and says, make a sentence using an if conditional. Or they draw another card, says, make a sentence using the past form of I. Now, this does a few different things. Uh, one, it makes the student unsure of what they're going to get. It adds that pleasant tension. But then from a teacher point of view, I can simply make various sets of cards. I can make my low-level card set, my intermediate card set, my advanced card set, and I can just swap those out. So instead of remaking the board every single time, I can just swap out the cards and I've got a game appropriate for my, uh, my students' levels and abilities. So I've moved from imperfect to, or sorry, I've moved from perfect to imperfect and I've added a tension element that I hope will get the, the students playing. Um, so I've gone from this to this. But it's still a racing game. So I have my In My Trace Travels game. Students are still racing across the board. And the description states, gather knowledge as you travel the country. So really, at this point, the game is draw a card, answer the question, move forward. Well, if the first player answers them all correctly, they're going to win because they went first. It's still not good. It's still not great. There's still some missing elements to that there needs to be a little more balance. So the game needs a point mechanic, so perhaps collection, uh, points collection could be added through making decisions. And really, that comes down to strategy, which is the third and final key component of using games and game design mechanics in the classroom, is give the students choices that will really influence how they play and how their opponents will play. Because as Sid Meier says, you know, a game is a series of interesting decisions. And if you've played his game Civilization, you know that it's just all a series of, of decisions. So my decision should influence yours and vice versa. And a good game reflects the cumulative effect of player choices until there's an outcome, until a win state is achieved. And strategy and action are linked in a lot of ways. You know, the more actions I can take, the more I have to consider my choices and the choices of my opponents, so I have to really think carefully about what it is I want to do in my game. So I'm really still looking for that strategy in my Trace Travels game, because I've got this description, gather knowledge as you travel the country. The, players with, uh, the player who reaches California with the most knowledge wins. So travel the country accumulation points of the most knowledge. So I wonder how I can get my choices and strategy to really be fixed there. So I'm looking at my map, and right now everyone just keeps moving west. Well, 
what if on each turn a player can choose to move towards California or draw a bonus card or a challenge card? So the choice then becomes move forward or stay in place. So the way I could do this is I could have you know, bonus cards. So for instance, I could sacrifice moving forward and draw a bonus card where I just get extra points. I don't have to answer any questions. It's kind of like a fun little bonus, but I sacrifice moving forward. So if I just kept drawing bonus cards, I would never get towards California. And of course, if I rush towards California, um, I may not get there with the most points. And then I also have these challenge cards. So I thought about doing these challenge cards. So with a challenge card, it's more complicated grammar or more difficult vocabulary perhaps that they have to spell. But there could be um, kind of a high stakes setting to that. I could maybe make it three points. Maybe I could really go, go for broke and make it like 10 points. But with that challenge card, I could manipulate that as well. So, you know, like I said, with my bonus points, just one to five points, we never know how much they're going to be worth. So I'm going to take a risk. I might sacrifice a move forward and only gain one point, or, or I might sacrifice a move forward and get five points. Um, but with the challenge cards, you know, it could be sort of a gambling situation where I draw a challenge card, and if I'm certain my opponent doesn't know it, I could give it to them and they have to answer it. If they get it wrong, they lose those points. Or, you know, I could keep it for myself and try to answer and get those points. So it gives students a, a way to kind of um, negotiate one another's points. I can deduct, deduct points from you, I can add points to myself and vice versa. And also, you know, you it gives a little bit of a balance to the game where a player's not going to necessarily shoot for with a lot of points and the other players can kind of keep them in check. Now it's not perfect, still needs workshop, but it's a way forward. So now Trace Travels is a game where I have to balance moving forward across the board with gaining points and trying to lessen the points of my opponents. So let's add one more strategy, which is limited resources. Now, you know, as I said, my theme kind of sh shows I have four characters. So I have Trace, Professor Peterson, Kitten, Eddie. Well, how can I use the theme of those characters to create an extra bonus? So what I thought about was each character has a special ability that can be used once or one time per game. So for example, you know, Trace, he can time travel and skip a space on the board. So he can move from, you know, Ohio to Illinois and, and skip Indiana. So it allows him to catch up. Right? Professor Peterson, I'm sorry, Professor Peterson can use smarts to get a question correct automatically. So if I pull a question, maybe one of those challenge cards, it's really difficult but worth a lot of points, I can use my one-time ability to get it for free. Um, Eddie can use his comic book. Inside of the game, the video game trace effects, Eddie loves comic books. So, you know, the student can open up their notebook and look at their homework notes to get help on a particular grammar point. And of course, Kit, you know, inside the, the game, she has a lot of friends. So for the Trace FX board game, she can ask the teacher for help. So use that, that social network component uh, to get help. And so each of the characters now have an ability. And the question is, is use it now or wait? And you'll see players differentiate between that. Some players are very conservative and like to keep everything. Other players like to spend it as soon as they get it. But allows the player to make a choice that will influence the game and the outcome. And the best part about something like this is, you know, afterwards and the players, you know, kind of smack themselves in the forehead and they're like, oh, I should have used that then. And it comes this reflective thing and they, they develop a strategy that they'll apply to the next version of the game or the next time they play. So we think about strategy and action combined, we get what we call emergence. And this is really important because gameplay emerges due to my uh, choice as a player. And so you make decisions, I have to base my decision off of that. And that really comes down to asking yourself, you look at your game, look at your classroom activity and say, how many verbs do my players have? Typically with younger learners, um, two to three verbs would be plenty. But with older players, if you have less than five verbs, um, they may start to grow bored. 
So somewhere between four to seven would be a good number of verbs for the players to have. Um, and as the older people get, the more verbs they can handle because um, their mind can, can handle the cognitive load. And of course, how many objects can each verb act on? So with the original board game, I had roll and answer, but I can only roll the dice. I can't roll anything else. So, you know, can I draw a bonus card, a challenge card, or a grammar card? So suddenly, you know, my verb draw acts on a few different things. So the more objects each verb can act on, it might be a better game. And of course, how many ways can players achieve their goal? And that's the weakness of my game so far, is that they really can only achieve it one way, by getting to California with the most points. So, you know, and there's some balance issues I still have to work out. So if a player gets to California very quickly, um, then what? Do they sit and wait? Are they out? Um, how does that kind of, how does the game get resolved? Is still something I'm working on. But the best part about that is I can take that into the classroom, have my students play, and see what they think. Because, you know, with designer's block, the biggest issue that we can have in making these games is where do I begin and what do I do next? And part of that really comes down to uh, not being afraid to prototype the game. And so how do we avoid designer's block? Well, there's a few different ways we can do that. You know, one thing you can think about is make a resource limited or unlimited. So, for example, if I have my one-time abilities for the characters, if I made those unlimited, that would really change the game. Suddenly, you know, a player could just keep getting bonus points with Professor Peterson. All the players would only want to use Professor Peterson. The game is broken. So, but it really kind of lets me understand the constraints and the confines of my game. So, you know, as you're prototyping a game, just try making a resource limited or unlimited and see what happens. Another great one is, you know, what if my players had to cooperate instead of compete? Well, if they're going to cooperate, what are they competing against? Is there some sort of... Um, Know, villain or is there some sort of challenge that they have to overcome and would that result in more communication? Of course if my goal is to practice grammar do I want more communication or do I want focused attention on specific grammar points? So there's a balance issue I have to consider there in terms of the game versus you know classroom goals and objectives. You can mess with the play order so if we always go clockwise what if things suddenly switched? Try it, see what happens. Uh, removing rules is always a great one. Oftentimes we tend to overrule everything. So if you have 10 rules, try to get rid of three and see what happens. Take an item and double it or make it half. Um, this is something we can do with rules. You know, So instead of having 10 rules, try five and see what happens. Um, also think about you know with objects in the game. So what if you doubled the points? What if you half the number of cards or um, half the number of abilities, what would be the outcome? And of course, steal a mechanic is you know possibly one of the best ways you can make a good game. And as teachers, we've been stealing mechanics for years. Um, we do all sorts of things like this. And one of the interesting things is a game mechanic cannot be copyrighted. You can copyright a theme, but you can't copyright an existing game mechanic. That's why we have Hangman and we have Jeopardy, right? That's why you know we have uh, tic-tac-toe and Hollywood squares because we can't really uh, take that mechanic, but we can add on to it. So in summation, you know games are really iterative. Um, there's a short design cycle where we design it, prototype it, see what worked and didn't. So don't be afraid to play a half-finished game, and that in and of itself can be really fun if you have students who love games because you could take your half finished game in you know kind of scratch your head and tell the students I don't know what to do and suddenly that becomes a writing activity they play the game and they write out advice and suggestions or they have to communicate with you about what needs changed in the game what I think would be better or worse so we can actually make this design iterative design process part of a classroom activity of course playing more games because the more games we play, the more design mechanics we can draw from. And we say, wow, that was really fun. I wonder if I changed those to verbs, what would happen? I wonder if I you know, did this or that. I'm still trying to figure out how to make a game using Jenga. I'm playing with the idea of building some sort of game where you 
draw the block, you pull the block out, and it's a verb, and you have to grab an adjective one, and, and build sentences using your blocks. Um, so the more we learn, the more we can draw from. And of course, they're cooperative, and like I said, get your students involved and make it task-based learning. You know, Have them really tackle it and see where they can take your game. What could they do differently with it? So there's a lot of great options there um, if we just sort of get the idea in place and then workshop it. Don't be afraid of a bad idea. And so here's a quick look at references. Uh, Brathwaite and Schreiber's Challenges for Game Designers, a fantastic game that uh, I highly recommend everyone read if you're really interested in this idea. Um, you know, with uh, Kurt Squire, of course, is one of the leaders with video games in education and video games and learning. He focuses mostly on history and social studies, but still a uh, great person to read his, his research and uh, literature. And of course, Will Wright down there at the bottom, he has a great talk about game design and what makes games fun. I highly recommend watching that if you have the time. So thanks. Thanks for listening and uh, play more games.